Praise God. I always say, and I know you probably get tired of hearing me say this, you can sit at home and watch sermons on TV, but you can never get fellowship at home like you can at church. And remember, the church service is all about the fellowship. It's all about coming together with like-minded believers and worshiping our awesome God. Amen? Amen. Praise God. My sermon title for this morning is, Where is the Lord when I need Him most? Where is the Lord when I need Him most? You know, on June 14th, just a week or so ago, I'm sure many of you were watching the news like I was, or listening, or getting alerts on your iPhone or Android phone, whatever. When an alert came through about a tragedy that happened down in Florida, a precious little two-year-old boy was down at a Walt Disney World resort with his mother and father. And he was doing what any two-year-old would do on a hot Florida evening. He was playing in the shallow waters of a lagoon. Mom and dad, his sisters were there on the beach close by, just relaxing and having fun. When suddenly, without warning, an alligator lurched out of the water and grabbed that precious little boy and began taking him back into the water. Dad was close by and he lunged at the alligator and he began to to fight the alligator trying to get his boy out of its jaws. You know, I was going to put the boy's picture on the screen, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. He's so precious. Dad lost that battle, unfortunately. In fact, the news reported that he had scratches and cuts and all kinds of injuries because of what happened. That started a search that lasted some 16 hours. And you know, when I heard about that event, all I could do was stop right where I was and say a prayer for the parents. Because the first thing I thought of was my own son and what it would have been like to have seen that terrible event happen. But not only that, I thought about what those 16 hours must have been like for those parents. 16 hours of torment. I know where I would have been. I would have been with my face to the ground begging God for some miracle to save my son. Of course, they found the boy's body. It didn't work out that way. But you know, as I thought about it, the, the news articles that I read said nothing about the parents being Christians, at least that I saw, or praying people. But I suspect even if they weren't praying people, they became praying people during those 16 hours. I'm sure they were pouring their hearts out to God, asking, where is God in this crisis when I need him most? That's what I would have been praying. Lord, save my son. Kind of like that nightclub shooting down in Orlando. You can say what you want about the nightclub, but don't you know when that Omar Mateen opened fire, then people began to drop to the floor, some of them ducking for cover, that people began to pray. They began to make deals with God. Save me, and I'll do this, and I'll do that, and I'll do this. Asking, where is God in this crisis when I need him most? You know, we all ask those questions when the storms of life begin to blow over us. We've talked about this before, but you know, I'm convinced as your pastor that we need to talk about this often. We need to talk about it frequently because the trials come sometimes rapidly without warning and sometimes back to back to back. We can begin to ask ourselves, where are you, Lord? I need you. I need you. We expect our God to help us and protect us. Amen? That's what we pray for. When we're going through the trials of life, we cry out and we want to know that He's there. But I wonder this morning, how can we know for sure that God is there and that He's helping us and working with us, that He hasn't abandoned us if the suffering goes on and continues? If the pain and the ominous thoughts and the fear and all of it continues. 
How can we know? Where is God when you need him most? Can you sense his presence in your storm? When we cry out to God, why doesn't he just put an end to that thing? Whatever it is that's bothering us. How can we know that God is with us? That's the things we need to look at this morning. Please, if you would, let's pray one more time and ask the Holy Spirit to guide and lead us. Father God, this morning we come to you with humble hearts, asking and praying for you to reveal yourself to us from your word. We thank you, Lord, for the word. We thank you for the promises that are contained therein. Because the Bible says, given unto us are great and exceedingly precious promises that through these we might become partakers of the divine nature. We want to claim those promises. We want to become partakers of the divine nature. Bless us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be looking once again at a, a piece of scripture I'm sure you've looked at before. Exodus chapter 14, and I'm going to be putting the words on the screen. Exodus chapter 14, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12. Exodus 14, verses 1 through 12. I've got the New American Standard Bible. You're welcome to follow along in whatever version you're using. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before pi Hahiroth. How would you like to live in a town named that? Between Migdal and the sea, and you shall camp in front of Baal Zephon, opposite it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, they are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know what, church? That I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people. And they said, what is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made his chariot ready and he took his people with him and he took 600 select chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. Then the Egyptians chased after them with all their horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them camping by the sea beside pi Hahiroth in front of baal Zephon. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were doing what, church? They were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word we spoke to you while we were in Egypt? That we may leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? They didn't say that. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Israel was on the long journey to their destination. As my mom used to say, they were going around Jacob's barn to get where they were going. Why? Because they didn't trust God the way they should. You see, the quickest way for them to get to the promised land would have been through the land of the Philistines. But they didn't have the faith for that. If you go back to chapter 13, God says he knew what would happen as soon as his people began to face war with the Philistines, they would have tucked tail and run right back to Egypt. Listen to me. The reason some of us are going through the trials we're going through is because we don't have enough faith for God to take us where he wants to take us. Amen. Or it could be like that picture I saw on Facebook this week. It had a sign and it says, everything happens for a reason. Sometimes the reason is because you make stupid decisions. That's all right. God can use those. God can use those situations too. God's people had not learned to trust Him. They had not learned to trust Him enough to go where He wanted to take them. 
Some of us are on the long journey to the destination God is trying to take us. I think about Bernetta heard that. Let me say that again. Some of us are on the long journey to the destination God is trying to take us. Verse 2 begins by telling us that God told Moses to have the sons of Israel turn back. It's like they had gone past. God says, no, turn them around and have them go and camp near Pi-Hahiroth facing the Red Sea. Of course, that move would later leave them trapped by the Red Sea. But you know what? That's exactly where God wanted them to be. Some of the trials we're going through right now is because that's exactly where God wants us to be. He knows what we need. He knows what's best for us. You see, God knew that his people needed to get jammed up at the Red Sea. God knew that the only way he was going to teach the people to trust him, at least some of the people to trust him, was through one crisis situation at a time and then him, his deliverance. Do you know that's how God teaches you too? Through one crisis situation at a time and then he delivers. Usually at the 11th hour if you're like me. God knows that the only way he'll be able to teach us is that way. Nobody likes trials. If you do, there's something wrong with you. I'm just going to say it straight out. If you like going through pain and suffering, Lord bless you. I don't like it. Nobody likes trials. But those painful times in our lives are the best opportunity for spiritual growth. They're the very best opportunity. It's one of the best tools God has. You see, the trial you're going through right now, this was alluded to earlier, the trial you're going through right now has been weighed, it's been measured by God, and it's exactly what He knows you need right now. It's exactly what He knows you need to accomplish His purpose in your life. Often we try to forcefully remove ourselves from situations like that. But if we haven't learned what God wants us to learn, if we haven't learned what God is trying to teach us, we'll soon find ourselves right back in the same situation. God will bring it back again and again and again until we get what he's trying to teach us. Why? Because as the song says, God is a good good father that's just who he is and he loves us he's persistent God also knew that in the case of Israel that when Pharaoh saw them turning back when he saw them trapped at the Red Sea he would assume that they were as good as his and that's exactly what happened as Israel heard the thunder of those chariots, and remember, 600 chariots plus all the chariots in Egypt. We don't even know how many chariots that is. But I can imagine the ground beginning to rumble, sounding like thunder. You know, a couple of nights ago when we were having those terrible thunderstorms that seemed like they were never going to end. Can't complain after, as Mark mentioned, what happened over in West Virginia. But you know, not only were my kids scared half to death, I've got a hundred plus pound German shepherd that was more afraid than them. Every time that the thunder boomed, he, woo, he was crying out. That's how Israel was when they heard the rumble of those chariots of Pharaoh coming to get them. They began to cry out to God and nothing immediately happened. They began to lose their minds. They began to go crazy as they were crying out to God. God, save us. But again, it seems they didn't get an immediate answer. Just like you and I don't get an immediate answer sometimes when we cry out to God. So they changed taxi, tactics and decided to, that they would begin to yell at Moses. <laughs> Why not? Things aren't working out. It's got to be somebody's fault, right? Got to blame somebody. Is it because there were no, not enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here in the wilderness to die? Why have you done this to us? I ask you, church, where was God in that ordeal? Where was God when Israel needed him most? 
Where was he? If you look back at chapter 13, verse 21, you'll see that God was right there with them. He was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never had a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night follow me around. Sometimes when my wife's mad at me, it does seem like a pillar of fire. But <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> you know, things are only funny because they're partly true. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make to you is this. Israel had a visible manifestation that God was with them at all times. The cloud shielded them from the sun during the day, and it provided light at nighttime. You know, I've never been out in the desert. Some of you have. I've flown over the desert and looked down from an airplane. But I've never been out there. But I've been told that even though the desert gets scorching hot during the daytime, at nighttime... It can get cool, really cool to the point it feels cold. That cloud, you see, not only provided light, it provided warmth. God brought climate control, if you will, to his people. He was with them at all times. But you know what? When they cried out to God and didn't get an immediate answer, they forgot all about that cloud. All about that cloud. Isn't that what happens to you and I? We come to church and we talk about God being with us at all times. We sing about it. We go to prayer meeting. Well, at least ten of us do. <clears throat> we go to prayer meeting. We come to Sabbath school and we talk about God being with us at all times. But the moment a crisis hits, where's God? He, he, he's, he's left me. Something's happened. Isn't it something how we doubt the Lord's presence in the middle of a trial? If he doesn't do exactly what we want him to do, if he comes through and does exactly what I pray, then yeah, God's with me, right? But if I ask him to make something happen and he doesn't do it, I need my job back, Lord. I know I got fired yesterday. Please give me my job back. I know I didn't get that promotion at work. Lord, I need that promotion. My girlfriend left me. Bring her back, Lord. I'm sick. Help me to get well, Lord. When it doesn't go away, suddenly, the presence of God has left us. Well, as Pharaoh and his chariots drew near, the people forgot all about the pillar of cloud and fire, as I said. They forgot all about God, and they began to panic and fear. They began to lash out at Moses. Maybe in the midst of your trial... You've been crying out to God and ominous thoughts are swirling around in your mind. Maybe the thing you're wrestling with has dominated your thoughts. That that's all you think about. It happens to all of us. It blinds us. You see, Israel forgot at that moment, even though there was a visible manifestation of God's presence, that he was right there with them. He was right there there with them the whole time. But you know what really I think Israel was asking? Where is God in this crisis when I need him the most? Where is he? The cloud's nice. We need him down here on the ground. They thought they were all alone in an ominous situation. They thought that Pharaoh was going to come in and slaughter them all. And yet God could not have been any closer if he tried. He heard every word that came out of their mouths. Listen to me. When you're going through a trial and you begin to complain, when I begin to complain, God hears every word of that. Reveals what's really in our hearts. Even one cry for help is heard by our God. Do you believe that? He hears every single one. Not even one of them goes unnoticed by God. 
God saw the Israelites. He heard them. And he sees you and he hears you. And he's planning your deliverance just like he planned theirs. It's true that God may know that the time is not right to deliver you from what you're going through. But you can bet this, you will never go through it alone. Never. I have a poem on the wall of my office that brings me a lot of encouragement, especially when I'm feeling down, when something's not happening I want to happen. I may have shared it with you before, I don't remember. Check it out. God's delay, delays are not denials. He's heard your prayers. He knows your every care. God's delays are not denials. Help is on the way. He's watching over all life's problems, bringing forth the day. God's delays are not denials. You will find him true, working through life's darkest trials, what is best for you. Wow. I need that sometimes. Look at verses 13 through 20. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. As you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea, divide it. And the sons of Israel shall do what, church? They'll go through the midst of the sea on dry land. As for me, behold, I will harden the heart of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know that what? That I am the Lord. When I'm honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen, the angel of God, who had been going before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel, and there was the cloud along with the darkness, yet it gave light at night. Thus one did not come near the other for how long? All night. You know, thank God for the people in our lives who tell us, hang in there. God is with you. God is going to come through. Hang in there. Don't be afraid. God is doing something. I believe he's working in your life. Surround yourself with people like that. Not the naysayers who point out all the problems and all the possible problems and all the issues and make you feel like you're doomed. Avoid those people like the plague if you can because you see there's a truth here you need to understand and that is this sometimes those people become the mouth of Satan just like Peter did with Jesus Jesus was predicting his suffering and Peter said don't ever say that Lord he said get thee behind me Satan Jesus didn't think Peter was Satan but Peter had become a mouthpiece for Satan avoid those people like the plague Moses was speaking for God, praise the Lord. And he told the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm. See the salvation of the Lord. The Lord is going to fight for you today. You're not going to have to worry about the Egyptians anymore, ever again. Moses must have took to praying at that moment. Because then God says, why in the world are you crying out to me, Moses? Tell the people to go forward. Now watch this. Moses says, stand still and watch God work. Moses says, I mean, God says, uh-uh, Moses, tell the people to go forward. Even Moses didn't fully understand. Another very important point here I don't want you to miss. God wanted Israel. Please listen carefully. God wanted Israel in the midst of their crisis to walk down to the banks of the Red Sea as if there were thousands of rescue boats there waiting to take them to the other side. They, there were no boats there. All they saw was a massive body of water that was trapping them in. But God wanted them to walk down there expecting him to do something. Go, he said. Go forward. You see, the people going forward according to Moses' command were 
tiny baby steps of faith. Little tiny baby steps of faith. I'm not saying the people trusted God the way they should. They didn't. But them listening and going one step at a time towards the Red Sea showed at least that they were willing to listen. Had the people refused, I'm not sure God would have opened anything for them. Where was the Lord? Again, I ask. In the midst of that crisis. He was right there the entire time. Fighting, working, encouraging the people to go forth through Moses. In the middle of your storm, press forward. Go forward. What does that look like? It means you avoid complaining. It means you keep trusting God. You're speaking words of faith. It means you keep doing everything that you can do and trusting God to work out the rest. Just like the children of Israel did there on the banks of the Red Sea. Keep going forward. It's imperative. Well, as the people begin to go forward, the cloud of God's presence moved from the sky to the earth in between his people and the Egyptians. The cloud made it dark for Pharaoh and it made it light and warm for God's people. What's more, I mean, what more could God do to show his people that he was there? If you keep your eyes open in the midst of your trial, you will see God revealing himself to you again and again and again. It's when you get paralyzed and blinded by the trial that you feel like God is not there. Finish this thing up, verses 21 through 29. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into what church? Dry land. So the waters were divided. The sons of Israel went through the midst of the water, the sea, on dry land, land, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Then the Egyptians took up the pursuit. And all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, his horsemen went in after them, Pharaoh's crazy, into the midst of the sea. At the morning watch, the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. He caused their chariot wheels to swerve. The New King James Version says to come off. He made them drive with difficulty so the Egyptians said let us free, flee from Israel for the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians then the Lord said to Moses stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may come over the Egyptians over their chariots and their horsemen so Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the, the, the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and did what, church? It covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them. Not even one of them remained. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Look at God. With Israel on the seashore, waiting to see what God was going to do next. And Pharaoh stopped by the cloud. I said Pharaoh's crazy because if a cloud comes out of the sky and stops me from pursuing somebody, I'm done. <laughs> That's all it takes. I'm certainly not going to walk up to a body of water that's parted and try to go through it and come after you. You can go. <laughs> He's crazy. But as soon as Moses stretched his hand out over the water, a wind began to blow that pushed the waters back until there was a dry path all the way through the Red Sea to the other side, which allowed Israel to walk through on dry ground. I can imagine it took all night. You're talking over a million people there. It took all night for that horde of people to make it through the Red Sea and get to the other side. But as morning dawned, 
that cloud lifted and went back into the sky. God was watching the entire process. Pharaoh's heart was stubborn. He went in after the people into the sea. Him, all his chariots, every single last one of them. And suddenly God continued to fight for his people once again. The chariot wheels began to come off. That dry path wasn't so dry anymore. It suddenly turned into mud. They couldn't go forward. They couldn't go backwards. They knew that God was fighting for his people. Amen. And then Moses, God told Moses, stretch out your hand over the water. And the moment he did, the waters came crashing down on Pharaoh and his entire army. You know, I wondered about this. What happened to Egypt after this? They have no army to defend themselves. Pharaoh is dead. What a blow. What a blow. So again, I ask this morning, church, where is the Lord when you need him most? He's right there by your side. Fighting for your deliverance. Working hard to grow you and to take you where he wants to take you. Ultimately to heaven. He'll allow the painful situation you're going through to last only as long as it's for your good. Only as long as it's for your good. Our job is to trust Him completely, to believe unreservedly, to believe He has a plan and a purpose for what we're going through, trusting that He's walking with us and that He's fighting for us. I know what you're going through may not be easy. I know some of us are going through severe trials, scary trials. But don't you dare think for a minute that God has left you because he has it. He's right there by your side. You're everything to him. For him to leave you would been, be for him to deny who he is. Let's finish this thing up. You know, a little over a year ago, Britain got a new job. She got a job with a new medical transcription company. For the first couple of few years, five years, whatever it is, that she was doing medical transcription, we were able to do things a little differently. We used her Mac computer and were able to run Windows on the Mac and she was able to do her work. But when this new company, they said, no, can't do that. It's gotta be a full-blown Windows computer. That's sad, isn't it, Gary? <laughs> it's gotta be a full-blown Windows computer, they said, because our tech people, won't know how to support a Mac running Windows. Wasn't a good time to buy a computer, let me tell you. So, got on Craigslist, buy, buy a lot of stuff off there over the years. Got on Craigslist and I found a nice HP, if you can call a Windows computer nice, an HP business class computer. Called the guy, actually before I called the guy, I stopped and prayed. I said, Lord, we need to buy a computer. Help us not to get taken. Help us to find something that's going to work for us. Protect us in this whole thing. Then I picked up the phone and called the guy. Super nice guy. He said he got the computer as a gift. He didn't need it, wanted to sell it. We agreed to meet at the Walmart down here on Ward's Road. So I went and met him. He brought the computer in a case. Actually, it's the case I'm carrying today. I kind of took that. <laughs> My wife... I got the computer out of the bag and I began to look at it. Everything seemed great. I was typing on it, moving the mouse around, everything seemed to be working. So I told the guy, I said, I'll take it. Gave him the money for it. it wasn't that much money. And I left there feeling like I got a great deal. Put the computer back in, took it home. When I got home, I got it back out of the bag and I began to play around with it and suddenly everything went crazy. I moved the mouse this way and it went that way. Keys on the keyboard stopped working. It's like, dear God, what in the world has happened here? I prayed about this, Lord, I said. I asked you to protect us, I said. What's going on here? So I got my phone out real quick and I, I was like, I'm going to call this guy. 
caller is not accepting calls at this time. <laughs> what? Okay, Lord, I prayed about this. What in the world? Got on the computer, found some instructions on how to take that thing apart. When I, I took the, because I read on there the, the ribbon cable for the keyboard could be off. So I pulled the keyboard out. The ribbon cable was all messed up. Somebody had been messing with the computer, obviously. I thought, well, I bought a boat anchor. <laughs> I bought a piece of junk. I guess I got stuck. But the next day was a Monday. That was a Sunday I bought the thing. The next day was a Monday. I picked up the phone and I called HP. It's kind of cringing to know what the damage was, how much it's going to cost to fix this thing. When I got on the phone, I gave the lady the model number, the serial number, and everything. She said, let me put you on hold and I'll be back in just a minute. She came back to the phone and she said, Mr. Hewitt, I have great news for you. And I said, well, praise God, because I need some good news. <laughs> and she said, this computer is fully covered by a three-year warranty. Amen. She said, in fact, if you need to ship it to us, we'll pay for that too. I said, come again? <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. They mailed me a box. I put it in the box, shipped it to them. A few days later, it came back. It was like brand new. Britain has been using that computer ever since. All I could say, forgive me, Lord, for not trusting you. Forgive me. Where was God when I needed him most in that crisis? He was right there with me the entire time. I may not know what kind of crisis or trial everybody here is going through. But I know one thing, you're not going through it alone. Amen. All right. You and your world are in the palm of God's hand. In your darkest hour, God is with you when you need him most. When the whole world is closing in on you, God is there to help you when you need him most. When it looks like there's no hope, God is with you. They're helping you when you need them most. When you don't see any way out, God is there with you, helping you when you need them most. Again, what he wants is for us to trust him completely, no matter what, no matter how things look. To believe that he has a plan, to believe that he's with you, no matter what the devil may try to tell you through somebody else. He wants you to go forward, trusting in your heavenly father. Because I promise... I promise, if your Bible reads like mine does, then nothing can hold the love of God and his care back from you. Nothing. Not death, nor life, nor angels, or demons, or things present, or things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Like a ship is tossed and driven battered by an angry sea Lord when the storms of life are
will take away all your sorrows. Why don't you let him have your burdens now?